Well, the Bureau of Compensation training on opioid addiction. My name is Steve Pesch. I'll be the instructor for this particular program. He looks that opioid dependency is a rise in the United States by prescription, whether it's illegal substances like heroin. Unfortunately, there is a problem in the United States. Person opioid sales in the U.S. quadrupled from 1999 to 2014, and since the year 2000, the rate of death from drug overdoses has increased 137%. It is an epidemic in many states, including Pennsylvania. In fact, one in seven Pennsylvanians die as of of the year in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This program is going to cover the topics that we have listed here. Now, folks, please remember that there is a wealth of information on the internet regarding opioids and opioid abuse and addiction, and we would suggest that you take the time to look on the internet and find out about the myriad of information that is out there, especially from good sites like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Let's start by talking about what opioids actually are. The opioids are derived from the opium poppy and the medications that relieve pain by reducing the intensity of brain signals that reach the brain and affect those areas that control emotion and diminishes the effects of the pain itself. Those medications we're talking about fall in classes like hydrocodone, with Vicodin. Some of you may remember the series House. Doc was actually addicted to Vicodin. Oxycodone, which is Oxycontin. You've probably heard that name come up in the news every now and then. Percocet is another opioid. Morphine, which can be put in certain things during surgery. Cocaine, which can actually be placed in cough medicine. These are all what opium, opi opioids actually are. Now, commonly prescribed opioids are, like we mentioned, hydrocodone, which many times you can get if you go to the dentist's office and they're ha you're having major, tooth, for example, a tooth pull. A dentist may give you hydrocodone, Vicodin, the pain that's associated with it or can be. More cases before or after surgical procedures to alleviate pain. In some instances, they actually have a patient hooked up to a device where they can self-dispense the morphine. Back in World War II, the combat medics would actually carry morphine syringes with them, or rats, and they would inject that into the muscle of the wounded soldier to try and take the pain down. Unfortunately, soldiers ended up getting addicted to morphine because of the amount that they were being given. Morphine is prescribed or can be for mild pain, and sometimes it actually can be put in the cough medicine. So these things aren't something that is not uncommon. It's out there, and it does, can be still used. If an individual gets injured at work, and this is how many times a situation can incur with getting somebody addicted to an opioid, and this is why we have the opioid epidemic. It doesn't matter if the person's rich or poor. It doesn't matter their religion, their race, it doesn't matter their age. Any can suffer a situation where they become addicted to this. And unfortunately, many times it happens because of injury that occurs at work. They go to the physician for a work-related injury. Their pain subscribes an opioid-based medication for them. The individual starts taking it. One makes them feel halfway Good. They take the edge off it, even be better. And then suddenly become dependent on this to relieve the pain. When it's time for the individual to go back to work and the physician says, you know, you really shouldn't be having this pain anymore. We're not going to prescribe the opioids for you. And that individual has to find a way to relieve that pain. What are they going to do? And unfortunately, many times they turn to things like heroin or other illegal substances to get themselves to the point where that pain, whether it's real or imagined, is relieved. This part about the heroin that they pick up, 
they only because it is illegal, they have to go somewhere to get this. And sometimes their heroin can be laced with things like fentanyl, which is an opioid that's 50 times stronger than the heroin, heroin itself. Now they become addicted to that. Now they have to get money to pay for this. And so they start going down a big dark, dark hole. And it is basically something that affects a person's brain and behavior. The addiction tells me that I need this particular drug or substance so that the pain will subside. And as we talked about earlier, if one pill makes me calm down, takes the edge off, how many, what is two going to do to me or three? These are things we have to think about. And now they then become dependent upon this. And the play get from this, they need more and more of it. And that's the unfortunate thing with this type of situation. If you look at the pictures we have here, abuse actually affects somebody's brain physically. You can actually see physical changes in the brain. If you look at the top picture, to the left is a healthy brain. The picture to the right is one of opioid dependence after seven years. Look at the difference in these brains. Look at how that can affect then a person's memory, a person's behavior. If a person gets away from these drugs, as you see in the bottom picture, one year drug free, the brain can actually start reacting and it can recover rapidly. So you can see the difference between one year drug free as compared to the brain seven years of opioid dependence. So we have to educate our managers and supervisors too, as well as family members, is to recognize the signs of somebody who may have an addiction or dependency to a substance, and especially an opioid. Many times if we look at an individual and their appearance, they're very well kept, they're clean shaven, they have very nice clothes, they, they're very, they're just very they, they're ready to go each day. And suddenly we see their appearance starting to diminish. They may not be combed. If they're a man, they're not shaving. They may have certain things about them that their clothing just looks as if it's been slept in, let's for example. That might be something that keys us to the fact that there could be something going on. There's some physical signs that we can look for as well. Blood eyes may be an issue. If their pupils are constricted, which is where they're almost pinpoint, or they're dilated, which is they're very big, that would be an issue. Change in appetite. Maybe we notice them gaining weight or losing weight. We detect unusual smells on their body, their clothing, their breath. It's sometimes to somebody who might be going through chemotherapy. Certain types of chemotherapy actually gives a person an odor, a different type of odor that you can pick up from somebody who their speech is getting slurred. Maybe the coordination is not what it used to be. It's impaired. Maybe they're getting tremors. So if they're using something that is, requires them to shoot it into their body, to inject it into their body, you might find needle marks on their arms or maybe other places like the webbing between their fingers. Sometimes people will shoot it there so that it can't be detected easy, easily. These things that we, as an employer, need to look for and pick up. Now, not, not all these things a definite indicator of an addiction or a dependency. Could be some other types of situations that are going on there for the individual, but at least this is something that gives us a thought and something to look for. There is a problem in the workforce, and it doesn't matter where you go in the United States or where you're at. It can happen, and as you can see by this chart that we have here, one in 12 individuals report use of illicit substances within the past month. One in 12. Most people are employed. As here, we're looking at adult binge drinkers or heavy drinkers. 79% are employed full or part-time. It sort of cuts that way when we're looking at substance abuse as well. So, yes, can it be brought into the workplace? It absolutely can. And this is why we need to be attuned to this and look for this type of thing. A situation where there is a, a people coming into work. You have absenteeism. Maybe people are losing jobs. Why? Because they're having difficulty maintaining a job. I have high, a high turnover rate because maybe these people
people just can't hold a job. They get themselves to the point where they either get fired or they just leave themselves. And as it says here in this slide, illicit drug use, people who have illicit drug use were more than twice as likely than those who don't to work for more than three employers in the past year. So perhaps when you're looking at hiring people, start looking at that. How many places have they worked in the past year? Could there be a problem? I'm not saying that there absolutely is, but could there be a problem? Things like this have to be taken into account. As a here, maybe they're going to be injured on the job or they'll get some kind of an illness. Why? Because maybe their systems are compromised. They're not performing like they should be. Their immune systems aren't operating as they should. They may be more susceptible to an illness. Maybe they do something that gets them injured on the job. The other thing is not coming into work, period. That could be an issue as well. As it says here, they could be more than likely to skip one or more days of work in the past month. If you see a situation occurring where maybe it's a habitual absence, that may be something to look at and think about as an employer. Hear about this stuff. Well, as it says here, you've got people changing jobs frequently. Think about how that impacts your organization. If I have to keep bringing in new people, then I have to keep training them. Then I have to have other things I need to look at. I have people who aren't there, that it means that other people are going to have to pick up that slack. That becomes an issue. These people may not be as productive if they have an abuse problem as an average worker. And that becomes a problem because we're not really getting the work that we need from that individual. And then other people may have to take up that slack, and now they become overworked, and they have difficulty meeting their production label, particular levels. These individuals are prone, could be three times more likely to be involved in a workplace accident than somebody who doesn't have an abuse problem. Now, that's going to impact under workers' comp premiums, isn't it? The more injuries that you have, the more situations that occur like that, the higher you may have to pay. And then filing workers' comp because they are getting injured on the job. Again, that starts taking money away from the employer themselves. People have a substance disorder in their family. A lot of people, when you find out that they have a brother or a father or a mother or an aunt or an uncle or a sister or somebody who has a problem with this. And unfortunately, many times you can talk to people whose individuals actually have died. One in four people with substance use disorder die as a result of it. It's happening on a regular basis, and it's sad. The problem we have with things like opioids is that they are a depressant, just like alcohol can be. If they're using, if an employee is using prescription drugs or heroin or anything like that, that's a depressant, they actually fall asleep on the job. That's about what they're doing. Suppose they're operating a crane or they're operating a railroad train or, or something like that, or they're on a production line and they fall asleep while they're putting through that. What they're going to do? Sometimes if somebody takes a large dose of a particular prescription, it can actually act as a respiratory depressant, and it almost makes it as if their body forgets to breathe, and that's when you have death. Things that we need to look at and think about when you're thinking about the overall opioid epidemic. Sometimes theft can occur within the workplace. Maybe a small amounts when you start disappearing. For example, you have a coffee fund, and there be a can or a box sitting there, and it goes missing. Maybe it's empty, but it's happening regularly. That, that could be a problem. That could be an indication that somebody has a substance abuse problem. Maybe somebody caught dumpster diving looking for scrap. They want to take that scrap to a junkyard and get paid for it to get money to support their particular habit. So you have to look for these types of things when you're thinking about the possibility of substance abuse in the workplace. Any just people who have substance abuse problems aren't going to have the decision-making that they need because they're stoned or high or what have you. Now they're not really having their full capabilities as somebody who is not in that position. Their action time can be slow. They're not making the proper decisions. They're not really thinking as they should. Remember that these particular drugs like opioids affect the pain center in the brain, and they also affect our decision-making. So now 
hey, maybe I'm going to put my hand somewhere that I normally wouldn't. And if something happens, I may not even feel that pain right away. So they become a detriment to me or particularly other people that are on the job. The ability to deal with people or complete tasks, that can be an issue for somebody that has a drug abuse problem. May have an issue getting along with people because moods can swing, their moods can shift. One, they're happy-go-lucky, the next day they're exceedingly depressed or possibly angry. This situation can affect the overall morale of the individuals in the workplace. So these are things that we need to look for when we're thinking about substance abuse in the workplace. What can we as employers do? Well, what we want to do is educate our employees on responsible prescription opioid use. These particular items help because they are an effective tool to mask acute pain. They can allow us to have a little bit better situation in our lives if we're recovering from an injury. We have to let our employees know what drugs can do, all right, how they worked, how they can interact with other drugs, which we call synergy, and what happens if they come addicted to these things? What do they need to do if they think they're having a problem? What can we do for them? We want to make sure that everyone involved is understanding the risks of opioid abuse themselves. Make sure that we as an employer are communicating these things to our employees. What can happen if you do get addicted to an opioid? What is the end result for you, for us? We, as an employer, want to make sure our employees understand about what's called doctor shopping. Basically, I go to one doctor and try to get them to get me a prescription of something. Maybe they don't, so I go to another one. And I try to find a doctor who will continue to keep prescribing these things for me. So we wear that as an employer. We also need to make our employees aware that, listen, we'll be looking things like that. We don't want to see you doctor shopping. Why are you going from place to place? What is the overall uh, method behind this? The thing we can do is we want to provide a support situation for them, a safe return to work if we have anybody who's injured. That's a big thing. As a supervisor or as a manager, we want to make sure that we can help, le- help them safely return to work, and that's a big thing. But it's providing a good support system, letting them understand and that they can talk to us. We have an open door. We have areas that they can go to to get counseling or assistance. You have one of the most important people in this whole process is the immediate supervisor. The immediate supervisor doesn't show the attention to detail that they need. There can be an issue. And this is the type of things we want to think about as an employer. We want to look at do we have a return to work program in place. It's a good idea to have something that, that works and is in place. Once get it implemented, it allows key steps to be taken all the time, every time, so that we don't have the amount of lost work days or to decrease wages lost our employees who are out on an injury. We want to make sure that we're taking the workers' capabilities into account as well. And this is what a return to work program program can do. We want to look at their abilities and their disabilities, and that's very, very important. We want to let our employees know what types of treatment options are out there. If it becomes a situation where we need to be treated with a certain, sub, let's say, an opioid, all right, what is out there to educate us on the options? What types of things can be used in lieu of this particular opioid? Maybe something like an ibuprofen or a naproxen sodium or something like that. Keep that this can be or is a brain disease, and it can be treated effectively. There are ways that it can be treated. There are many times we can do behavioral modification, and sometimes it's pharmacological interventions. Some of you may remember when people would talk about methadone clinics. Many times if people were addicted to heroin, You could put them in a methadone clinic, and it was a pharmacological type of intervention that allows them then to come off of this, and we can wean them then away from that. Somebody that might have a craving with certain 
things. So how do we get them into a situation that gives them the necessary strength that they need? Give them a social type of support that they're able to rely on. Again, about pharmacological interventions, and there be medications, as I said, methadone, that could be part of this. But the nice thing about these type of treatment options is that it's looked at the individual, and it's made to suit them. It's made to push in that we're looking at their clinical needs together. Another thing we can do as an employer is to ask the right questions of ourselves and ask the right questions of the positions that we're dealing with. We ask ourselves as an employer, how do we feel about the use of opioids as painkillers? What are you going to do if an employee does get a substance? substance abuse problem or does become addicted to these things. What's going to be the next step? How are we going to handle these? We can ask our doctors, what's your first method of treating pain? If an employee has now an abuse problem, how do you handle that? What? So the things that you want to look at, and the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine actually has guidelines in place that can be used and physicians can access and use themselves. Another thing we want to look at is having a drug-free workplace policy, something that is written, something that our employees can read. We want to educate our employees about substance abuse in the workplace or even substance abuse outside the workplace. We let people know where this policy is and how we intend to enforce it. We provide extra training for our supervisors. Let them be the first line of defense so they can recognize these things and possibly bring them forward. We want an employee assistance program in place, somewhere that people can go to get counseling, somewhere that people can pick up the phone, no matter what time of day it is, and say, listen, I'm having a problem, and get help with that. And then we want to look at drug testing. Now, we're caution about that. In mind, if you are an employer that is under OSHA regulations, you need to look at how you're doing your drug testing because OSHA has put in changes recently about drug testing. It may be a good idea for you to call your local area office and talk to them about that. Some other things we can look at is providing training for not only parents who might be have somebody that lives with them or might be noticing this of their children, but also families, spouses, significant others, people who might be involved, get them to see what the signs of addiction are, get them to notice changes in the individual. The testing by a certified institution, something we want to think about looking at and doing. And then we want to have a program in place that's ongoing. We don't want to do this once and leave it go. Maybe on a yearly basis, have somebody come in and do some training. Bring somebody from the outside in to help people out so that they get the entire understanding of this and they see exactly what we're referring to. Keep in mind that good policies include all the information we listed, any other employer-specific information that we need to put in there as well to make sure that that document is clarified. Right. What drug-free policies? Well, obviously laws and regulations that may exist for this. But also could be looking at things like insurance discounts. The thing we want to try and do with these types of policies, we want to try and prevent accidents and injuries on the job. We want to try and prevent absenteeism and productivity loss. All right, we want to look at maybe responding to a situation where we see there could be substance abuse. How do we do that? And we want to make sure that if people aren't having a problem with their drugs, there's a way to provide that support as well, all right? That's important. We want to make sure we have something in place that lets people know we're going to try and support them no matter what we have going on. We also look at the health and safety of an individual. That's extremely important. We want to allow people to go home from in a safe condition. And then we look at productivity. That's extremely important as well. Now, let's talk about some ways that these addictions or these types of issues are treated out of the street. There's a thing called naloxone, which you might have heard to it referred to, referred to as Narcan. This many first responders carry. Police, fire, 
you need medical, and we're finding that even some employers now have this in place. It does involve a lot of training to use, and it does work. We we'll refer to it as a second chance drug because an antidote that reverses the opioid overdose. And what it really does is it actually neutralizes the opioids that we have in our system and it helps the individual breathe again. Remember we said that opioid, opioids are a respiratory depressant. So now this is going to override that and allow the person to start breathing. Now it only works if the person has opioids in their system. If you have something else in their system, it's not going to work, and it could even be detrimental to them. But when you talk to people who are first responders and have used this Narcan, you find out that it can be very quick. This is 10, 15 seconds, the individuals back up, even quicker than that sometimes. So it is out there, and that's something that is being used now on a regular basis, and you'll see more and more first responders are actually carrying this now. Now, we talked about physicians before, and physicians have to be an integral part of all this, especially if you have physicians on your panel. Many of you that have workers' comp know that you're going to have a physician panel in place. Get those folks involved. Talk to them. But what do doctors do? Well, basically, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually says that physicians don't even prescribe opioids people who have chronic pain. They're looking for things like a non-opioid pain reliever, such as I mentioned earlier, naproxen sodium, ibuprofen, things like that. And doctors you talk to now, they're starting to go that route as opposed to providing some type of, prescribing some type of opioid-based medication. The C also recommends that the physicians get the patient to have a urine test. Find out if there's any opioids in their system to begin with, and then if we determine as a physician we're going to start treating this individual with opioids, we want to start them at the lowest dose possible. The other thing that the CDC recommends is that the physician prescribes immediate release type of products instead of long-lasting types out there. Looking at the treatment plan itself, and Putting that down to no more than seven days if they're going to prescribe an opioid type drug. Person who has a substance use disorder can be protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act as having a disability. Now, if a person has a substance use disorder for illicit drugs, but they're no longer using the drugs illegally and receiving treatment for the drug addiction, or if they've been rehabilitated successfully, they are protected by the ADA from discrimination on the basis of past drug addiction. But if they're still using, they're not protected. However, an employer may still be able to discipline, discharge, or deny their employment to anyone who's an alcoholic or use of alcohol adversely affects their job performance. So keep in mind, we're talking about substance abuse, in general, and part of that is alcohol, but again, there's a caveat. The best thing to do is check with your legal department and find out exactly what you can and can do. That's a very good idea to get yourself into a position where you understand this. And opioid abuse, the opioid epidemic, epidemic is something that's real. I don't know it'll go away soon, and that's the unfortunate thing. So what we need to do Employers, we need to be aware that there is an opioid epidemic out there, and we just can't say that, well, there's no epidemic, there's no problem. It's there. Any organization, any individual can be affected. It doesn't matter. To ensure that our supervisors and managers are looking for the signs and symptoms of this type of thing. Let them be educated to it. Let them know what to do if they suspect it. Employers need to have a no-tolerance drug use policy in place, and they need to be willing to enforce it, no matter who that individual is. It's important. An employee who does have an addiction or abuse problem needs to be encouraged to get help through our employee assistance program, through counseling, through any way that we can get that individual help. We need to encourage that because many times these individuals can be helped can be rehabilitated, and then they're brought back into the workplace 
as very viable, good employee. Later, we thank you for viewing this particular program. We want to let you know that we can be contacted through our past program, which is one of that station. We have a lot of different free PowerPoints available that you can use yourself. All you do is contact us at our resource account here, and I will put an arrow there for you that you see what we're looking at. Here we go. Right here at this resource account, if you contact us, we would be able to give you a listing of PowerPoints we have and provide you with this PowerPoint as well as the many others we have. And we have well over 190 different programs available now for your use. Thank you, gentlemen, for listening to this program. I hope you found it beneficial. I hope that you have a great day.